session in such a beautiful afternoon, so I, I hope you'll find uh, worth it. Uh, this is uh, my conflicts of interest, which are not really relevant to this talk. However, I would like to disclose, as uh, John did before, that for the LandSafe study, we need to say some big thank you. One is to the entire uh, group that led the study, and particularly the executive committee with the latest addition of uh, Fabiana Madotto, a statistician who is now working on this analysis. ESICM for providing us the um, sponsorship to the study and all the LangSafe investigators. And I hope some of you might be sitting in the room. I see one down there, for example. So uh, the use of, of non-invasive ventilation in ARDS, uh, sorry, in critically um, ill patients with acute respiratory failure is increasing. I think I'm sort of preaching to the choir. We all know that more and more we are using um, um, non-invasive ventilation to uh, treat our patients. So, for example, if we look at this interesting uh, observational study by Alexandre de Moulin and co-workers, we see that uh, this survey looked at the use of NIV over uh, in three different periods, and the use of NIV, which is, was already quite high for uh, chronic respiratory failure, increased over the two following observations. There was a clear increase for cardiogenic pulmonary edema as doctors are recognizing that this technique is working and tend to use it more and more. But still, the fact uh, that one of the results of these analyses is the fact that in what they call the de novo acute respiratory failure, which for sure includes IRDS, there was not such a clear trend. So somehow, I think what this reflects is the fact that literature data on the use of uh, non-invasive ventilation in ARDS are uh, not so convincing, and perhaps to the fact that in daily clinical practice, while everybody is convinced that NIV works for uh, COPD, for cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the, the daily clinical practice is not so compelling for ARDS. Still, even if the NIV use is increasing, or maybe because the NIV increase is using, also, the success rate of NIV is increasing, which is encouraging. We are not uh, just using it uh, in a non-selected population. We know what we are doing. We treat more patients with NIV, and this is more successful. Still, if we think of the use of non-invasive ventilation in ARDS, we have to acknowledge that there are, for sure, some advantages. Uh, we can use less sedation, keep our patients awake. We can protect their muscle from become uh, atrophic. We can, by definition, prevent intubation and uh, complicated complications associated to intubation, such as VAP. However, as I uh, mentioned before in the discussion with Marcus, we have to keep in mind that we lose control over the drive of the patient, or at least we have less control over this drive. We uh, must accept the risk of higher tidal volumes. There is a certain limitation in the amount of positive pressure that can be applied by non-invasive uh, techniques. And there is a non-negligible increase in oxygen consumption and hemodynamic-related consequences due to the presence of spontaneous breathing. So I think uh, we have to acknowledge a second important point, which is if you look at this paper, uh, uh, the, they use the, the, these investigators reports the use of non-invasive ventilation in 10 patients with acute lung injury ARDS. So it looks like a very preliminary report on the use of NIV in ARDS. But if you look at the data, this study is not, was not published like 30 years ago, but uh, 15 years ago. So just to tell that the story of NIV and ARDS is a relatively short story, young story. We still have to learn a lot in this field. We have to learn a lot on invasive mechanical ventilation for sure, but we still have to learn a lot for non-invasive ventilation.
Uh, there are more recent reports on larger cohorts like this by Massimo Antonelli that, for example, has shown that uh, in non-invasive ventilation is able to improve oxygenation in ARDS patients, but that uh, if uh, oxygenation stops improving, this will likely be associated with failure. Still, this was done on a relatively small uh, cohort of patients, and it was um, um, done in a few centers. So I think uh, a few years ago we recognized with a group of, of other investigators that there was a need for a large data set of ARDS patients managed with NIV. Uh, when you don't know anything or you know little about something, perhaps also an observational study can tell you a lot to understand what we do, how we use NIV nowadays, to understand better uh, the classification, to evaluate the classification of ARDS patients provided by the Berlin definition, and to uh, assess what factors were associated with NIV failure, death, and so forth, perhaps to uh, lead to future large uh, RCTs on this field. And I would like to stress a little bit this point of the uh, Berlin definition. We heard about it because if you look carefully at the Berlin definition uh, and, and you look at how oxygenation in defi is defined in the mild category, you will see a little uh, note here only in the mild category uh, that refers to PEEP or CPAP, which can be delivered non-invasively in the mild ARDS group. And this is not exactly univocally interpreted. Some people interpret this such, uh, so that all patients with NIV should be considered as uh, mild ARDS. Some others say that this is like a recommendation. In, a, in other words, the way the definition is, is written is not entirely univocal. Uh, univocally interpreted, I would say. So I think uh, our idea was also to get a little bit more insights on how to classify NIV patients. So you heard already about the uh, lung study uh, uh, goals, uh, which I will quickly go through. But I would like to uh, point out here, just at the very end of the slide, that one of the uh, pre-specified uh, I wouldn't call it point, but objective was to understand more about the use of non-invasive ventilation in the management of ARDS. He, basically, the inclusion criteria were very broad uh, to make sure not to miss any patients with ARDS, and this was the main paper recently published on the JAMA. We started of a court of 3,000 patients with ARDS, and uh, we had uh, 436 managed that, um, sorry, patients that were managed with ARDS on day, both day one and day two of their ICU stay. So uh, this is something I should uh, carefully mention. We define patients treated with non-invasive ventilation as those patients who underwent NIV on the first two days of their ICU stay. Now, if we look at this paper that was also shown before by Neil Ferguson, like uh, a supporting paper to the original RDS definition, these authors somehow recommended, uh, and yellow means that uh, the recommendation is, uh, is based on some data but is not so strong, recommended the use of non-invasive ventilation in mild RDS or in patients with a PF ratio higher than 200. So the first question is, how are we using NIV? Are we restricting the use of NIV in less hypoxemic patients? And when we looked at the incidence of NIV use in mild, moderate, and severe RDS, it looks like there is not much of a trend. We are just using these um, ventilatory strategy in about 15% of our patients, no matter whether they are uh, mildly hypoxemic, uh, hypoxemic or severely hypoxemic. Uh, these uh, results are uh, being um, evaluated by a journal and they are very close to, and this paper is very close to be uh, accepted, so I hope it will get out soon. Uh, if we look at, so 
what these slides show is we are using NIV independently on the baseline severity of the patients. However, when we decide to use NIV in a patient who, according to the Berlin uh, criteria, is moderate or severe, so has a PF ratio below 200, we must be prepare to accept very high failure rate. And this cohort of patients, again, I, I stress the fact, is patients who were treated with NIV over the first two days. So it's not just patients coming in the ICU that had a very short period of NIV. These were patients in whom somehow clinicians for at least 24 hours decided not to intubate them. But still, if you use NIV, in uh, moderate and severe RDS, you have to be prepared to a relatively high failure rate, whereas this was much less the case for mild RDS. Then how does uh, burning criteria behave in terms of NIV patients? So, or are all these patients the same if they are treated with NIV, or does PF ratio bending have a meaning in these patients. And I think, we think it does, because if you look both at ICU and hospital mortality, you will see that also in NIV patients, there is an increase in mortality. Uh, if you bin the patients according to the mild, moderate, and severe criteria of the Berlin definition, like what you would do in the invasively ventilated patients. I'm sorry I'm missing the significance here. The test is uh, significant for ICU mortality on the edge of significance for hospital mortality, but I think you would recognize that there is a clear increase in, in mortality. And also, there is a, a trend for an increased uh, duration of ICU stay uh, according to the uh, band of PF ratio. So I think we can say that perhaps we can use the Berlin definition in more or less the same way in whether the patient is being invasively ventilated or non-invasively ventilated. Uh, Another result that struck me a bit was I would have expected NIV to be used more in patients with immunosuppression as this has been traditionally uh, a population uh, in whom the use of NIV has been described. But besides for moderate RDS, there was no real difference in whether these patients are treated with invasive or non-invasive ventilation. But of course, NIV is used in patients who have ARDS and COPD uh, as a comorbidity, and this is not surprising given the very high uh, success rate of NIV in COPD patients. What is the big difference between the patients which, who we treat with NIV and with invasive mechanical ventilation is in fact the non-pulmonary SOFA score. It looks like our decision to put a patient on invasive ventilation is more driven by the rest of the organs, particularly the use of pressors rather than the lung condition. And this is not surprising. It's, it's uh, more difficult to treat a patient on high pressure dose on, and non-invasive ventilation. But still, this is a very strong signal that, that shows a separation between these two groups. <clears throat> When we use P, uh, sorry, when we use NAV, we also have to accept, as uh, we can imagine, that we are forced to use lower levels of PEEP in both in moderate and severe ARDS. In severe ARDS, invasively ventilated patients have a, a PEEP on average of 10, which I personally think is still quite low, but it's even lower in um, NIV patients. And this is the finding that I personally uh, found the most interesting of the entire work. This is the level of BACO2, which, if you will, is an indicator of respiratory drive, but it's also an inverse indicator of minute ventilation or, or um, alveolar ventilation. Look at BACO2. Now, the, the axis is very big, so the difference looks small, but they are, in fact, not that small. If you look at PCO2, uh, in the invasively ventilated patients, the more severe the patients are, the higher the PCO2. And this is not surprising, okay? More severe patients have worse CO2 elimination. 
but it is exactly the other way around in, in non-invasively ventilated patients. Because these patients with severe RDS are breathing as hell because they want to survive. They feel hypoxemic, stiff lung, and they breathe stronger and stronger and stronger. And so we need to be aware of the fact that the tidal ventilation, the minute ventilations that uh, we have in non-invasive ventilation, particularly for moderate and severe RDS, will be much, much higher. I go to the conclusion as I used all my time, sorry about that. Uh, of course, crude mortalities are difficult to compare. There is no statistically significant uh, difference in crude mortalities, but these are different to compare because the two population, invasive and non-invasive ventilation, are uh, non-invasively ventilated are quite different ones. We have tried to address this with a propensity matched analysis. We were able to match some 350 patients who were uh, very well matched. And what we found is that overall there is no uh, significant difference between uh, air, um, between invasive ventilation and non-invasive ventilation. But if we focus on the more severe patients, those with a PF ratio below 150, it looks like NIV patients have a higher mortality rate, whereas there is no difference between the two uh, types of treatment for uh, patients with less uh, severe ARDS. How our study has some uh, limitations. The largest one, if I could go back in time, I would uh, put in the CRF the hours of NIV used per day, which is an information we are missing. Uh, we did not include patients with a uh, high flow nasal cannula, and we have no data on which interface was used. And clearly, being an observational study, uh, we have potential confounders that are not accounted for. So my conclusion is that NIV is used, LungSafe has shown us that NIV is used in about 15% of the cases, no matter what the severity is. We have a high failure rate in moderate and severe RDS, different ventilatory management, and we might have a worst ICU mortality, although with all the caution, because this is an observational study, in the more uh, hypoxemic patient. And I thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for taking too long, much time. Thank you so much, Giacomo. Any question from the, from the floor? Uh, could you please make clear which patient do you, did you show us? Uh, you, you, you told us that you include patients after one or two days in RDS, but what about the mechanical ventilation they were receiving before inclusion? They were under oxygen, under NIV? Uh, or <clears throat> Yeah, so these patients uh, were, those patients who were, uh, these patients were on, uh, had been on um, ARES since two days and on NIV for two days. We have data, none of these patients was on mechanical ventilation before, so they were either on oxygen or NIV. This, ah, sorry, the, the, we are not including patients who had like, post-extubation NIV. These patients are not included here. We have those data, but they are not included here, if, the, if this was your question. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Just a quick question. The, um, the higher mortality in the NIV group was adjusted for immunosuppression because I saw the data about immunosuppression, but yeah, uh, I didn't so get... Yes, the... the I've sh shown you the crude mortality, which is just crude, not adjusted. In the uh, propensity match, uh, we had matched also for the rate of immune suppression, uh, which uh, is uh, the same in the uh, two groups uh, here. It's non-different. You have about 25%, 22 and 25% in both groups. So this is... You have to believe a little bit in propensity match, okay? This is why <laughs> you have yeah. to trust that the, this process works, but for what we could match them, they were matched. Thank you. Thank you, Vito. <coughs> yes, please. Okay. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, because uh, use an IV in severe hypoxemic patient is hard to imagine. And, uh, could you give me a suggestion about the station in an IV used in those uh, severe hypoxemic patients? Or maybe it may need some muscle, neuromuscular agent use? Uh, uh, 
So we, we, the, the, the truth is we, we did not uh, collect data on, on sedation. So unfortunately, I, I cannot answer your question. I think it's one of the reasons why NIV is so difficult to apply in severe ARDS patients, because these patients are breathing really strong. You would like to sedate them, but on the other hand, they are not intubated. And I th don't think uh, we, we really have a room for neuromuscular blocking agents in, in NIV ventilation for time being. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any further question? And just maybe a last question. Did you look at the uh, experience of the centers in NIV in this setting and to the nurse to patient ratio to manage NIV? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Uh, we actually found that there was a, um, an association not much with the nurse-patient uh, ratio, but with the physician-patient ratio in terms of the, of the failure. And I'm not, not sure if this reflects a better care or perhaps a better selection of the patient. When you have a slightly higher number of, patient, of, of clinicians, maybe you select more carefully the patient in whom using an IV, and then you're more likely to, to succeed. The experience on an IV use, uh, no, and I'm not sure we have, we have the data on that. We could look at, at uh, the number of beds and ICU sizes, but not specifically on, on an IV. Okay. Thank you so much. So if there are any further questions, we have to close the session and to thank very much the, the speaker for their the talk and the audience for the active participation. Thank you so much.